Amen. You may be seated. No turning back. Amen. No turning back. The cross before me. This world behind me. Amen. That's a good song. I forgot I had that song. I don't think we've ever played that song yet. Amen. That's just good stuff. You know, that's, that's the, the cry of, of Christianity. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Amen. When you've truly been saved, when you've truly had your heart changed, when you've truly been born again by the Spirit of God because of the blood of Jesus that was shed for you, that will be the cry in your heart. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. Amen. No turning back. Amen. The children could go to Sunday school. If they want to go. And if they want to stay, we're going to have Sunday school in here too. Amen. Amen. Well, in, in trying to find a direction to bring this and trying to find a direction to go, I, I really felt like over the course of this last week that the Lord had led me in this direction. And we'll be going this morning to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew and, and chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And it's important that we understand in these last days. But let's, let's be real because Jesus said that and the Apostle Paul said that even those days that they lived in were the last days. The last days have not just begun Today, but rather the last days began, the very day that Jesus was crucified, the last days began. The last days began the moment that he cried out, it is finished. Yeah. It is finished. The work is done. It is completed. It's over. It's been taken care of. It's been addressed. What's been addressed? Sin. Amen. Sin has been addressed. The separation of mankind from a holy, righteous God was addressed. That's what Jesus was talking about at the cross that day. So you can rest assured that the last days, they began way back then. And they have continued up until now, some 2,000 years later or whatever it has been. It's continued up until this day. We're in the last days. We have been in the last days. And we will continue to be in the last days until that glorious day when the Lord says that it's enough and the trumpet sounds and He comes back for His church. Yeah. Amen. The last days. Yes, the Word of God tells us that in the last days there will be scoffers. There will be mockers. There will be those that will say, well... He's been supposed to come for all these years now. He's been supposed to come. You really still believe in this fairy tale, in this existence of this God who's supposed to come back. You really still believe in that. That's the last days which we're in, which we've been living in. Amen. The last days, the Word of God says that there will be perilous times. In the last days. That, that there will be, men will be prideful. There will be boasters. Covenant breakers, haters of truth, disobedient to God. We're in those days. We've been in those days. We continue to be in those days. And it's important that we understand that the Word of God, it leads us to a place of salvation. But not only does it lead us to a place and person of salvation, but it leads us to a person and a place of sanctification. And we've got to understand as Christians, sanctification must ever be, it must ever be our pursuit. Amen. It must be ever what we're pursuing after is more and more separation from the world and the things of the world and a closer walk with the Lord, a closer walk with God through His Son Jesus and what He did for us at Calvary. So it's important for us to understand how it is that we walk that walk, amen, where it is that we start that walk, where it is that we continued in that walk, and how it is that we continually continue in that walk, if that makes sense. And as we look around the world today, as we look around churches today, we find that there's many different walks 
that are offered. There's many different ways that are offered for the saint to reach this sanctification. Now I'm not even talking about the, the process of salvation because the majority of Christian churches will point you, and I, I still believe that that's true, that the majority of Christian churches will point you to Jesus and what He did at Calvary to get saved for your initial salvation. But it's after that, it's after that where we begin to separate the wheat from the tares. It's after that where we begin to, to find out that that path begins to really widen in Christianity. I'm dealing with Christianity today. I'm not dealing with Islam. I'm not dealing with Catholicism because Catholicism is not Christianity. It's not a denomination of Christianity. It's not an offshoot of Christianity. I'm not dealing with Mormonism because Mormonism is not a denomination of Christianity. It's not a, 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 a denomination, if you will, like Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostal or whatever. It's a false religion. It's a false doctrine. I'm not dealing with Jehovah's Witness because it's not Christianity. Right. You understand what I'm saying? It's not Christianity. Those things do not fall in what I consider to be Christianity. Because they do not lead you solely to Christ, who He is, and what He did for your salvation. Okay? So what we're dealing with today, what we're looking at is Christianity. Christianity, the way that we start this walk and the way that we continue in this walk. And I want to preach a, a, a message this morning entitled, From Which Tree Do You Gather? From Which Tree Do You Gather? And we'll be in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 is where we'll start reading. But first, if you don't mind, I drink some water and then we'll pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, we thank you for your written word. But even, even more than that, Lord, we thank you for your living word, your son, Lord, whom you sent down from the heavens, Father, who, whom he was so willing to, to come here and to take upon himself flesh. That He may bring us closer to You, Lord God. That He may fulfill Your will, Lord God. Jesus' life shows us what Your will was for His life. And in there, we see the will for our life, Lord God. A, a trip to Calvary. Your will for Your Son's life was a trip to His death at Calvary, Lord, so that He could bring us nigh unto You, Lord. And we, we ask today, Father, as we explore Your Word, as we get into Your Word, that by Your Spirit, You would continue to confirm what Your will is for our life, Lord, that You would teach us, that You would guide us, and that You would lead us into all truths by Your Holy Spirit. And we give You all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll start reading in verse 13. And Jesus would say, Enter you in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few be there that find it. Now this right here in this particular area we see that the Lord is describing the many different ways of salvation that man claims. The many different ways that you can enter into salvation. That you can enter into the kingdom. That you can enter into a relationship with God. And like I said we're not going to focus on those many different ways. We're going to go a little past that. We're going to go a little deeper into that because this morning I'm dealing what I believe is, is hopefully people that are all saved, that have all been born again, uh, that have all been convinced that Jesus Christ, who He is and what He's done for them, is their need for salvation and that they've been born again by the Spirit of God. So we're going to go a little bit further past that and we're going to look at what it is to continue to evaluate the tree that you're, you're receiving your fruit from, the tree that you're eating from, and also to evaluate the ones that are feeding you. It's important that you as Christians evaluate men. Let me say that again. It's important that you as Christians evaluate men. You should ever be putting me under the evaluation, if you will. Not trying to judge my heart, but looking at my life to see if what the Word of God says should be going on is going on. What should be taking place is taking place. And likewise, you should be doing the same in your life. 
You should be doing the same in your life and in your heart to make sure that what the Word of God should be, says should be going on is, is going on. So right here as we move forward, we go into verse 15. Jesus says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Now let's look at two things about verse 15. He says, Beware of false prophets would come to you in sheep's clothing. In other words, they're dressed like sheep. They look like sheep. They sound like sheep. They talk like sheep. They even eat like sheep. See, you can't tell them apart by just looking upon them, by just gazing upon them. Amen. That's what the Word's telling us. Beware of false prophets. They come in sheep's clothing. They come to you looking like a sheep. You know, it would be kind of equivalent, and I'll use this analogy, to a person driving down the road. I remember at one time this was going on, uh, especially towards females. Females were being targeted by certain individuals that would dress like cops. They would have the lights, they would have the badge, they would have all this good stuff, and they would impersonate. And just to look upon them, you couldn't tell the difference. You couldn't tell the difference, and Jesus is telling us right now in this passage here that we should evaluate false prophets. We should ever be looking for false prophets. Everyone that steps into our life in a ministerial position to preach the Word of God, to teach the Word of God, we should constantly be evaluating them to make sure that they do not fall into this category of a false prophet, a false teacher, a false preacher. Now let's also, let me go a little further. Not everyone who is in false doctrine is a false prophet. Is that okay that I say that? Not everyone who is in false doctrine and caught up in false doctrine is intentionally a false prophet. They're not a, a ravening wolf because I know men that I know without a doubt who are caught up in false stuff. They're caught up in false doctrine and I personally don't believe that they're ravening wolves. I don't believe that they're out to devour the sheep but I do believe that they've lost their way somewhere along the way and that they have been the victim of a false prophet and they have been the victim of not evaluating the prophets who stood before them. Yes. They've been a victim of doing what it is that we need to make sure we don't allow to be done to us. Yes. Because if we do allow it to be done to us, we'll find ourselves in that same position. Do you hear what I'm saying? We'll find ourselves in that very position where we'll be caught up in false doctrine in a wrong way, leading people astray unintentionally. But see, then there are those who intentionally come in. They intentionally do not care about the things of God. They do not care about the people of God. They do not care about the kingdom of God. They do not maybe even believe that there is a God. Let me make this real clear. Christianity, religion, is a hot commodity. Yes, it is. You hear what I'm saying? It's a money maker. Religion is a money maker. Religion will make you money. It, it will put money in your pocket. And just like a lot of businessmen out there, there's a lot of good businessmen that can care less about the business they're in or the consumers that consume their products. But they care a whole lot about what they're getting paid. And they will act like they care about their consumer. And they will act like they care how good their product is. But the truth of the matter is, all they care about is their next vacation. All they care about is their next car. All they care about is how big their house is. All they care about is the popular company that they keep. And right here, this is what Jesus is talking about because he says, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. Now that word ravening, that word ravening, it means a greedy person. A greedy person or an animal given to greed or extortion. This is particularly dealing with people that want to fleece the people. They want to take from the people. They want to get money from the people. They want to get a bigger bank account from the people. They want to get a big business. I didn't say a church, a big business from the people because that's what those type of people, that's what they look for. They're looking to make a business out of you and I. And not everybody 
that stands up behind a pulpit and not everyone that puts on a smile and hugs you and says I love you not every one of them loves you not every one of them cares about you not everybody not every one of them is concerned with your growth and your walk in the Lord Jesus Christ do you understand what I'm saying today do you do you hear what I'm saying it's real important church that you be you be careful you be careful of what you look to what you listen to of, of who you let speak into your life and who you let speak into your heart amen it's important that, that you do that then he goes on to say you shall know them by their fruits do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles now he says you'll know them by their fruits you'll know them by their fruits and then he goes on to say that do men gather grapes of, of thorns? Let, let me read, make sure I read. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? So what's he saying here? He's saying that to properly evaluate the fruit, to properly evaluate the fruit that's coming from this, from this person, you must first evaluate where the fruit came from. Amen? You must first evaluate the source. You can't just look at the fruit. You've got to evaluate the source of the fruit. You've got to go past just the, the eye test of the fruit and you have to get to the source. You have to get to what's producing the fruit. Amen. And that always goes back to the tree. The tree that's being pointed to. The tree that's being lifted up. The fruit here that we must be seeking. The fruit that we must be looking for is the fruit of the Spirit. It's got to be the fruit of the Spirit. It's got to be the, the love, the kindness, the peace, the meekness, the joy, the humbleness that only could come from the Spirit of God. Yes. Not the false peace, the false love, the false humility. See, walking around with your head down and just not saying anything to anybody doesn't make you humble. It doesn't mean you're humble. That's right. Just because you do. You want me to tell you what true humbleness is? True humbleness is a person who is continually coming to a place of brokenness, who is continually coming to a place of self-depravity, who is continually coming to a place that they realize that in their flesh dwelleth no good thing, that in them there are mess they're undone they're lost they can't do it they can't live this life they can't walk this thing out they can't accomplish what it is that God has told them needs to be accomplished and unless God steps in unless he intervenes unless he reaches into their heart and he does a work that they cannot do it that's humility that's depravity that's brokenness that's mourning over the sin that's in one's own heart. Over the sin that's in one's own life. Let me tell you something. The Spirit of God, as He works in you, will bring about depravity in your life. Does that make sense? He will bring about depravity in your life. Because it's only a, a, a sense of self-depravity, of, of self-brokenness, that will lead you needing the Savior that you need. That will lead you to realize how much you need Him more and more every day. Ross and I talked about this last night, this very thing. Because this has been on my heart for some time now. It's been on my heart. And how much I'm realizing more and more, Mr. Curtis, how much I'm realizing more and more that in and of myself, like Paul said, there dwells no good thing. There's not an ounce of good outside of the work of Christ in my heart and in my life there's not an ounce of good that dwells within me even the best of what's in me is no good and I'm coming to a place today where I realize that more and more each and every day and it leaves me crying out saying Lord except that you intervene in this miserable life of mine except that you intervene in this wicked heart that dwells within me except that you intervene I'm undone Lord I don't know what to do I don't know the next step to take Lord I don't know the Holy Spirit will do that to you he'll bring about a sense of, de of, of self depravity that will leave you not trusting in self. 
You see, the only way to be broken of trusting in self is to realize that there's nothing in self to trust in. To realize that there's nothing there that is worth trusting in. We as people, especially Americans, we're, we're, we're raised up, we're taught to trust in ourselves. We're raised up and we're taught to be the best that we can be, to, to, to work hard and do good. And, and listen, all those things are good things. Okay, all those, there's nothing wrong with working hard. Hard work is, is good, it's good to work hard. There's nothing wrong with doing the best that you can and being the best person that you can. There's nothing wrong with these things in and of themselves. But those things are not the fruit of the Spirit. Those things are not the production of the Spirit in your life. Now, can the Spirit bring about those things in a person's life? Yes, He can. But you know what? There are people out there that are good people. There are people out there that are hard workers. There are people out there that are respectful. There are people out there that are all these things. Does that mean that they have the fruit of the Spirit? No, not at all. It, it does not at all. So your evaluation must go deeper than that. It must go even further into evaluating what the Spirit of God does in a person's life, how that He works in a person's life. Amen? And we see it with people like Paul. Paul is one of the greatest examples when we talk about depravity. A person who comes to self-depravity. I mean, he, he even brings out the fact that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. That he was circumcised the tenth day, I believe, the tribe of Benjamin, if I'm not mistaken. That he was all of these things when it came to Judaism. But what did Christianity do? What did the Spirit of God do? The Spirit of God made him realize that everything he was was nothing. That everything he was was no good. That everything he was brought him no closer to God. And it left him saying that in my flesh dwells no good thing. Is your Christianity bringing you to that place? To where you're saying that in me dwells no good thing? Lord, in me dwells no good thing. I need more of you, Lord. I need more of you to even make me want more of you, Lord. It's got to be all about you. All about Him. Gabriel, can you turn that air conditioner up or something? I think it's getting kind of chilly in here. So beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? What is the condition of the tree, church? What is the condition of the gospel that they're bringing to you? What is the condition of the doctrine that's being handed out, that's being fed to you? What's the condition of that? What's the condition? What does it look like? What, what's the tree look like? What does it smell like? What... What, what is it surrounded by? How do you get to that tree? All of these things are important. All of these things have got to be evaluated. You want to look at the fruit? You need to look at the tree. You want to make sure the fruit is good fruit? Yes. You need to look. Let, let, me, let, me, let me go in this direction. You see, most people look at nuns. Women who take their lives and they separate it to God. I'm going to be separated to God holy. Never going to give myself over to a man. I'm only going to be dedicated to God. And they look at that and they say, man, that's sanctimonious. I mean, you're talking about a love for God right there. They love God. That They love God. But is that really a love for God? Or is that a love for self-righteousness? Is that a love for your own holiness that separates you from everybody else and makes you look more than everybody else? I'm not saying that at the root of what they're trying to do that there's no love for God. But is it the right tree? Is it the straight, narrow way? Is it the only gate? Is it the right tree that's producing this? Because truly what ends up happening, 
what ends up taking place is that maybe they start off in the right direction, setting their self apart for God, but really and truly, they're setting their self apart for the Catholic Church, and they're setting themselves apart for the priest and the Pope. But they're not setting themselves apart for God's way, for God's provision, for God's direction. They're not setting their self apart for that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Just because something looks sanctimonious, something looks holy, something looks so good, it does not necessarily mean that it's of God. To evaluate whether or not something is of God, we must go, we have to go to the Word of God. Amen? We have to go to what God says about His way. To what God says about the way that it is that you should go. To what God says about Himself. We just finished talking Wednesday night and preaching out of Romans. And we talked about Romans chapter 1 and verse 28 where, where the Word of God says that they did not like to retain a knowledge of God and we talked about how that in the Greek that did and like it means that they put God on trial they put him up to the test and they did not like the results of where God landed on their test they did not like the God of all creation they did not like what he said about himself or who he said he is so they changed him to fit what they like and who they like they changed him to be the God that they like and the word of God says when they changed him to be what they wanted him to be that he gave them up to a reprobate mind which means a trialless mind it means that because he did not meet their standards of what they thought that he should be he gave them over to a mind that could not even judge the things worthy of salvation he gave them up to a mind that was controlled by their own evil hearts and when the church changes God's way, when the church changes who God says He is, when the church changes what God accepts and what He doesn't accept, what He does in return is He begins to turn them over. He begins to give them over to a reprobate mind. He begins to give them over to a mind that's incapable of judging the things that pertain to salvation and pertain to Him. And you see it all around depending on what church you go to you get a little different God at one church you get a God that says homosexuality is okay at another church you get a God that says a little bit of drinking is okay at another one you get a, a, a church that, that says well Christianity Jesus God and Allah is the same right. basically so they've changed him they brought him down. In Romans right there, in those verses, in verses 25 or 23 to 28, that's saying that they brought God down from the glory that he claimed is his down to a lower standard. Let me tell you something, church. Don't be guilty of allowing God to be brought down to a lower standard. Don't be guilty of thanking God accepts what you want him to accept. Don't be guilty of thinking that he accepts what others want him to accept when he says he only accepts one thing. When he says there's only one way. When he says the gate is narrow. I'm telling you, I, I, you can listen to people stand up and they'll preach the gate is straight, it's narrow, the way is straight, it's narrow. And then when they step down, they'll accept everything under the sun. They'll accept everything. In these last days, we've got to be a narrow-minded people. We've got to be a straight people. Amen. We've got to be a, a judgmental people, if you will. I know that won't fly good with a lot of people, but we've got to judge some things out here today. We've got to look and evaluate some things. And then he goes on to say, Even so, every good tree, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So once you've established the type of tree 
then you can move on to evaluating the fruit. Once you've established the tree, then you can evaluate the fruit. Then you can decide on the fruit that's there or the fruit that's not there. Amen. A good tree can't bring forth bad fruit. A bad tree, it can't bring forth good fruit. But can a good tree bring forth no fruit? Can a good tree bring forth no fruit? In other words, what I'm saying is can somebody stand up and preach the true gospel? Stand up and, and proclaim the true gospel? Yet there be no fruit in their life. Yet there be no fruit coming forth. There be no fruit coming from the Spirit of God. Can that take place? Is it possible? So verse 20 says, Wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. So is their fruit? The previous verses said that a good tree can't bring forth bad fruit, but it did not say that, a, that it could not be barren. It did not say that it could not be destitute of fruit. That it could not be destitute of the fruit of the Spirit being brought forth. Do you understand what I'm saying? You need to evaluate your teachers and your preachers. Let me tell you, let me just break it down for you. I'm far from perfect. I'm far from perfect, church. I, 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 in and of myself, like Paul said, I, there's nothing in me that dwells any, in, that, there's nothing in me that's any good. I, I know that I understand that I see it. I deal with it each and every day of my pitiful life. I see it. From the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep, I see it. But what I do know about myself, Curtis, what I do know about myself is that deep down inside of me, Anna, there's a desire and a longing for the things of God. For the things of God. Not that I would attain to them personally. But that they would spring forth from the inside of me. And come forth out of my life with no effort from myself. Because when I put my hands in. When I put my effort into it. I just mess it up. I mess it all up. And I get it all mixed up. And the more I see how depraved I am. And the more I see how much I mess things up the more I'm having to depend and rely on Him. The more I'm having to, to say, Lord, please teach me to leave things alone. Please teach me not to put my hands in Your work. Please teach me not to speak my own opinions into Your Gospel, into Your Word. Please teach me, Lord, to stay crucified. Please teach me to stay with my hands nailed and my feet nailed in your son that I can live with him and that he can live through me yes. that's one thing I do know about my life I'm not telling you that if you were to evaluate every detail and aspect that you would come out with the fact that I'm perfect because you wouldn't you'd find out very quickly that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mess but I believe that you would find a person that wants to live for the Lord. A person that don't want to turn back, Ross. I don't want to turn back. I cry out to the Lord and I say, Oh Lord, if you don't do something in me, I will be back. If you don't cause me to walk upright, I will be back where you found me, Lord. If you don't cause me to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit, I'll be right back where you found me, Lord. I'm a mess and I need you and I'm coming to a place where I personally believe that true Christianity that this is part of the process yes. that part of the process to walk in my faith is learning that you're depraved and that you're lost and you're miserably undone not just when he found you but each and every day thereafter see when he found you you didn't come to this place of supernatural heroic strength no when he found you 
you was at a place to where you knew that you were depraved. That you knew you needed a Savior. That you knew that you needed something inside of you that you did not have. And the process of Christianity should never, ever, ever, any day of that process bring you out of that place. It should never bring you out of that place to where you think you've got something that you can offer up to where you think that now you can walk on your own. That you think now that you don't need to hold his hand anymore. And part of that process is a process of being broken. Sometimes learning all over again of your depravity. Sometimes learning all over again of your incapability of walking upright before Him, except that He would walk upright in you. Yes. And except that He doesn't walk upright in you, I'm telling you, you cannot, I cannot, no one can walk upright before Him. No one can. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. What I want to do, I want to run over real quick. To Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And we'll start reading in verse 18. This is a little, a little story here. Not a parable. Actually happened, took place. Now in the morning as he returned in the city, he hungered, speaking of Jesus. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is this fig tree withered away? Now I want you to look at something about this fig tree. From a distance, the Lord, He looked upon this tree, and it had leaves. So He assumed, because of the fact that it looked like a good tree, that there was fruit on it. But when He got to the tree, He found out that nothing was there. He found out that, that there was no fruit there. That there was nothing there worth anything. And because of that, he cursed the tree that it would be withered. And right away, it withered and it died. I'm here to ask you, are you a fruitless tree today? Are you a fruitless tree? Is the Lord working in your life? Is He at work in you? Is He, is he by His Spirit producing fruit in your life? Is He bringing you to a place of brokenness? Is He bringing you to a place of self-depravity? Is He humbling you under His mighty hand today? Is He humbling you? I'm telling you, the only way you'll be humbled is by being broken. The only way that you'll be broken is by being brought to a place of depravity to where you realize that you're depraved and that without His working in you, there's nothing, no nothing. And that's worth anything. Oh, well, that's not good preaching. You're telling us we're worthless. No, I'm not telling you you're worthless. God loves you. He died for you. Obviously, you're worth something to Him. He loves you. But in you is corruption. In me is corruption. In men out there is corruption. And you must be careful that the ones you listen to, that the, the things you hear, is not coming from a heart of corruption. It's not coming from a heart that desires to fleece you, that desires to take from you, that does not care whether or not that you make it to glory, that does not care whether or not that your life is being changed from glory to glory and from faith to faith. And I cannot evaluate your heart no better than you can evaluate my heart. But what I can do, church, is ask you to evaluate your heart. 
evaluate your heart and, and make sure that there's something going on. Something's taking place there. I mean, I, I, I just don't personally think you can live this life with the Spirit of God living. Look, Ross and I talked about this last night. I, I, there's things in me that are different than what they once were. There's things in me that are different, but there is also a brokenness being brought about. There's something going on that the Lord is, is bringing me back to a place of more and more dependency upon Him. More and more trust in who He is and what He did for me. And I believe that's a, a place of preparation. Yes, it is. I believe it's a place that He's teaching me how to walk. He's teaching me how to walk by what? How to walk by faith. How to trust in His work. And not how to trust in my feelings. My emotions. Or, or my oratory, if that's even a word. I might have just made that up. I don't know. Abilities. How to not trust in all those things. Is He working in you? Are you a fruitless tree? Do you, do you have something there to offer the people? Is there something there that someone could, can receive life if they came and needed to eat from you? Do you have something to give them? Is the Lord bringing forth something? That's the question that you have, to, you have to ask yourself. We're going to go back to chapter 7 real quick. In verse 21. We're fixing to get serious right here. We've been serious, but we're going to get even more serious. We'll start in 20. And when the disciples saw it, ah, I went to the wrong place. Chapter 7 and verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So, what is the will of God, church, for your life? What is the will of God for my life? What is the will of God? Well, before we move too much further, let's look at verses 22 and 23 and see what the will of God is not. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Let's get something straight. Just because you cast out devils. Just because you preach the gospel, just because you do this or you do that, does not mean that you're walking in the will of God. That does not mean that that's God's will for your life. I didn't say those things were good or I mean were bad. I didn't say any of that was bad. But when you look to that, when you look to the things that are being done by you, which is what these people did, they looked to what they did to make them acceptable and make them good before God. And the evidence was whenever they stood before Him, the first thing that they said was not, Oh Lord, I've been washed in the blood. But the first thing they said was, Oh Lord, look what I did. Look what I did. Lord, Lord I went to church every Sunday. Every Wednesday. Lord, I, I, I sang and I preached and I gave money in the plate and I said, God, and I posted things on Facebook about you, Lord. Didn't I do all these things, Lord? Didn't I? And then I will profess unto them that I never knew you. Depart from me, you that, you that work iniquity. So, the will of God for your life is not wrapped up in everything that you do. You understand what I'm saying? The will of God for your, not, and for your life is not all about what you've done for Him. And how much good you do and all that good stuff. 
But what is the will of God, preacher? What is it? Well, let's look. First of all, the will of God for your life will not leave you depending on what you think you've done. The will of God in your life will not leave you depending on how good you think you've been or how much you think you've done. The will of God won't do that in your life. Because like we said a minute ago, the Spirit of God, when truly working, will lead you to a place of self-depravity to where you're learning how to not trust in self more and learning how to trust in Him more. That will be the Spirit of God working in you. So when you're getting to that place, believe you me, you will trust less and less in how much you know, how much you preach, how much you teach, how much good you've done, how many devils you done cast out. You will trust less and less in that. Right? You won't be trusted. So when you'll stand before Him, the first thing you'll see won't be, Oh Lord, look at, didn't I cast out devils in Your name? I did not do this in your name. Did not do that in your name. Let me tell you, when the Spirit of God's working, I truly believe, when the Spirit of God's working in you, and that day that you're called home to stand before Him, the first thing that you're going to do is drop to your knees and cry out and say, Holy, 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 you're worthy. O oh Lord, of all the glory, of all the honor, you're worthy. Yes. O oh Lord, because you've been your whole life being groomed and taught that you're depraved, that you're incapable, and that your best life now is only a life of death. That your best life now is only a pursuit of less of you and more of Him. Less of them and more of Him. Less of everything that the world has to offer and more of the Lord. Jesus Christ. And let's go to 1 Thessalonians. And I'm getting ready to close here within the next hour. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Y'all laugh, but I didn't. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're talking about the will of God here. Let's talk about the will of God. I'm not talking about the will of God of where you're supposed to live or the will of God of what you're supposed to do. No, I'm talking about the will of God for each and every person's life in here. I remember Brother Larson said at one time, preaching at camp meeting, he said, I can tell you the will of God for each and every individual in this room. And I thought to myself, wow, that's a pretty big statement. But in fashion, like Brother Larson always does, he wasn't lying. And when he was finished, I said, you're right, preacher. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. For this is the will of God. I said, for this is the will of God. Even your sanctification. Even your sanctification that you should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. You've got to know how to possess your vessel, your body in sanctification. How to keep it there, how to hold on to it in sanctification and in honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. See how far I was going to go to seven. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncle for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. God, He's called you to holiness, church. Well, that's law. No. That's the will of God. Well, that's the will of God for your life is holiness. It's holiness. It's separation from the world. It's sanctification being set apart. Being set apart unto God and unto His working. I didn't say unto His work. I said unto His working. 
This ain't about you being set apart unto His work. No, it's about you being set apart unto His working so that He can work in you. So that when He works in you, then He can work through you. Not for you to work for Him, but for Him to work in you. Set apart to His working, to His holiness, to Him doing a work in you and through you. Is He working in you, church? Is something going on? Are you the same today as you was when you stepped foot in here? Are you the same today? Is there something different in your life? I didn't ask you, did you act different? I said, is there something different in you? Because anybody can act different. Anybody can act a different way. But can you truly tell that there's something deep down inside of you that's different than what you used to be? Can you tell there's something different there? Can you tell there's something there that's not you? Can you tell there's something there that's holy, that's righteous, that wants to separate you from the world, that wants to separate you from the things that you know are unholy, and unrighteous. Can you tell? You don't believe that's the will of God for your life. Well, let's, let's go to Romans real quick. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And we'll just read verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, unto God which is your reasonable this is your work this is your reasonable service present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God holy and acceptable but what makes you church holy what makes you church acceptable what makes you holy what makes you acceptable unto God how can you be this living sacrifice, a living dead thing? Because a sacrifice is dead. Sacrifice aren't offered up alive. This isn't about you living for God so much as it is about you dying to self and allowing God to live through you. Allowing God to live in you. See, because there's a lot of people out there trying to live for God. And one day when they stand before of them, a lot of them is going to evidence that by saying, God, didn't I do this? And didn't I do that? And didn't I do this? But let me tell you what a living sacrifice is going to say. Oh, God, didn't you do this? And didn't you do that? And didn't you die for me, Lord? And shed your blood for me, Lord? Didn't you change me, Lord? When I was rotten and lost and all messed up, didn't you come in and call me unto your cross? Didn't you do that, Lord? Didn't you do all that? Holy, holy, holy. What are they pointing you to, church? What tree are they pointing you to? Are they pointing you to trust in your production? Or His? Are they pointing you to trust in all you do and will do and all you don't do? Or are they pointing you to trust in him and all that he did, all that he accomplished. Which one are they pointing you to? And if you're being pointed to the right one, is there fruit being brought forth? Is there something different? Is something changing in your life? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The will of God, church. This is the will of God for your life. This is the will of God for my life. And I guarantee you, if we seek out the will of God as far as this is concerned for our lives, everything else is going to fall into place. How do you know? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. 
His righteousness, everything else is going to be added unto you. Are you seeking His kingdom and His righteousness? Are you seeking His kingdom and His righteousness, with all, which only comes by you being made holy and acceptable in His eyes, which only comes through who Christ is and what He did for you? Are you seeking that? See, church, our lives should be a pursuit of righteousness. Christians, children of God, your life should not be a pursuit of how rich you can get. Your life should not be a pursuit of how big of a house can you get, how much more money you can make, but your life should be wrapped up in a pursuit of righteousness. We, church, should be pursuing righteousness first and foremost before anything else. Now, we also must know that it's not our own that we should be pursuing. It's not our own actions of righteousness that we should be pursuing. You see, because I can make a distinct difference between my acts of righteousness and the flow of righteousness from my inside. Do you understand what I'm saying? When the Lord's living in, in you and His righteousness flows from Him through you, there's a, di a distinct difference between Him performing righteousness in you and you acting righteousness on the outside. Am I making sense? Is that, is that yeah. making sense? I can, for me personally, I can make a distinct difference between when God's performing and when John's performing. And my goal is that John does not perform, but that rather the righteousness of God performs in me and through me. Amen. Now you can lie, you can put on a show, you can act righteous and do righteous and be righteous before everybody. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you must ask yourself, and you must do this between you and God. God, is it really truly you or is it me? acting righteous. And you know the answer. You don't even really have to ask God. You know already. I know already about me. You know already about you. But you need God working in you both to will and do of His good pleasure. You see, it's one thing. Christian, you should have the, the desire for righteousness. If you're born again, if you're, if you're truly born again, you've been born again, the Spirit of God lives in you. He placed a desire for righteousness in you. He's gave you the will. Now your pursuit is that He do the do. You hear what I'm saying? Yes. Your pursuit is that He do in you. That He do through you. And let me be honest with you, there's going to be times, there's going to be moments, there's going to be seasons when you feel like that He ain't doing the do. But there will also be that desire for Him to do. There'll be that strong desire yes. not to pretend. You see, some people just want to pretend, but I'm talking about a strong desire for the real thing, for the real thing coming through you. I'm talking about you can't settle for no Sam's choice after you done drank Coca-Cola. You hear what I'm saying? You can't settle for you acting something out when you've done experienced him performing yes. it in you. Yes. 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 Desire, longing for that. Amen. Desiring that. Here's my last area here. Philippians 3. Philippians. Wait a minute. I went to Philemon. They always get me confused, them two. Philippians 3. And verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered to the loss of all things, and do then and do count them but dung that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship 
of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Church, we're a living sacrifice. Our life should be, it shall be a pursuit of righteousness. And if, you're right, if your life is truly a pursuit of true righteousness, then that will be a pursuit of Christ, which is a pursuit of death, which is a pursuit of Calvary, a pursuit of the death of the cross. And that's what Paul was talking about here. The fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Let me just prepare you for your walk in the message of the cross. In Christ crucified. It's a walk of failures. It's a walk of self-failures. Because the more that you think you know, the more you'll find out that you don't. The more that you think you can speak, the more you'll find out that sometimes you just need to shut up. Come on, that's good preaching. I'm talking about my life here. I'm talking about my experience. The more you think you've learned how to walk, the more you'll realize that you're still sitting and you've never even begun. The more you pursue this, the more you'll find out what's really inside of you. And I'm here to tell you that as you find out what's really there, don't quit. Don't quit because you're going to find out. You're going to be exposed. All right. I always say this: the cross is a. It's a. The message of the cross is a message of exposure. At first, it starts to expose everybody else, but then it starts to expose you. And then you start getting so caught up in you being exposed that you can't hardly look at anybody else anymore. You get so caught up in you being exposed to yourself that everybody else's big plank becomes a little bitty smote and your beam starts to show. I believe that's what the true message of the cross does to a person when it's being acted out by the Spirit of God. It brings them to that place. It leads them there to that very place. I've seen it all around me. I've seen it in me. I've seen it, I'm seeing it go on now. I've seen it take place in people's lives. I've seen it. That's what this gospel does. So don't lose heart. Don't quit. Don't give up on God's way. Because God's way is a way that wants to bring you to trusting and depending on Him. Even for the smallest things. Even for toast, Ross. Huh? Even for toast. If you know what we talked about last night, you'd understand what I'm saying. Even for a suit. Right? Like Brother Blessed. Even for a suit. For a Bible. For, for those little things that will bring you to a place. To where you're so depraved. In and of yourself. That all you want to do is trust in Him. Because you get so scared of trusting in yourself. That all you want to do is trust in Him. I'm beginning to get so scared of hindering the Spirit of God in my life. That I'm scared to make one little decision. Without knowing that God has told me to do so. That's where, I'm, that's where I'm coming to right now. I'm coming to a place that I'm so scared to quench His Spirit and hinder His Spirit in my life that I'm, I'm being brought to a place of just wanting to learn how to trust in Him for the littlest decisions in my life. See, I grew up in a church that told you God gave you a brain so you can make your own decisions. But what I'm understanding is that's not totally true. He gave me a brain, but He didn't give me one tainted with sin. That happened in the garden. And now, because we've been tainted with sin, we must ever learn to die to our own decisions and our own judgment from within our heart and depend on the judgment and the decision making of the Lord. Now you hear what I'm saying? We need the Lord to work in our lives, church. 
We need the Lord to, to do something in us. We need Him to do something in us. We need to pursue Him the right way through His work, by faith, in who He is and what He's done for us. We need to evaluate what people say. We need to evaluate the production of their life. Not their failures. I, people are going to fail. Don't give up on somebody because they fail. Amen. Let, me tell, let me tell you something real quick. man. I know, I know I probably should have closed already, but it's okay. What the, what the message of the cross will do to you, all right, what I'm finding that it does is doing to me, it's giving me more mercy for those that fail. Why? Because I ever see failure in my own life. You hear what I'm saying? I, when people are quick to kick somebody to the side, let me tell you, the Spirit of God is not working. When they're quick to tell somebody they can't sing or they can't preach or they can't do this or they can't do that because they're not holy. The Spirit of God ain't working because they're not holy either. And if the Spirit was really truly showing them, they would chill out a little bit with that. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. See, I have, a, I have a hard time. I'm not going to let somebody come up here and preach and teach and do all that when they're just blatantly living in sin. But I have a hard time telling somebody who's struggling with something that they can't sing and that they can't preach. You know why? Because this old boy here is always struggling with something. Always. Mercy, compassion, tenderheartedness. I don't even know I can just keep going forever. But I better stop. Let's stand. A pursuit of righteousness, church. A pursuit of Christ. A pursuit of death. A pursuit of the cross. Amen. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. Lord, we just thank you for your love, Lord. Oh, Lord, we need you, Lord. Lord, I need you. I need your spirit in my life. I need your spirit in my heart. Lord, I need your grace to fill me, Lord. I need your grace to guide me, to lead me, Lord, to, to teach me to walk, to walk for me, Lord. To do everything, Lord. I need you to do everything in my life, Lord, because I'm incapable of even the smallest task on my own, Lord. Lord, I just surrender my heart and my life to you, Lord. And I just ask for your mercy and your grace here today, Lord. Lord, lead us, guide us, Lord God. Direct our paths, Lord. Teach us how to walk, Father. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.